you agree Washington is dysfunctional? Oh, yeah. Okay, so... But, but it doesn't matter which party's in charge. I, I spent 10 years up here in the Senate and left early because I don't see a solution in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. Congress to fix what's wrong with our country. The federal government's out of control. Everyone knows that. We are unmoored from the rule of law. And if you look at history, all republics eventually fail over the same thing. Runaway expenses, a bloated government and bureaucracy, too many federal regulations. Right now it's like we're on iron rails and unless we do something, then we're going down path. They're 18 trillion in debt. Every child born in the United States now owes over $50,000 the minute they're born. If you have one out of control Supreme Court, one out of control Congress, and one out of control president, there's nowhere to go. And that's the problem, unless we go back to the Constitution to save the Constitution. So what are we going to do about it? Now the biggest tool in the box is this Article 5. We've had 27 amendments to the Constitution passed, but none have passed the other way that Article 5 calls for. But the founders added a fail-safe in case of an out-of-control federal government that allows the states to draft and approve amendments. The founders put this in there and said, in case it ever goes awry, the states can get together. Our founders, actually, in their wisdom, they gave us a constitutional way to address this. This is the method the Constitution gives the states to try to rein in the federal government. There are a bunch of us who are coming together to make this happen. I want to help rein in a federal government that's running amok. The only way we're going to save this republic, I believe, is to get about the process of the states regaining and recontrolling the federal government because it is the states that created the federal government. It is the states that must control it. The only way the federal government is going to be reined in and that we are going to preserve the United States of America for our kids and our grandkids is as states. A balanced budget amendment, tax limitations, spending limitations, term limits on Congress, curtailing the power of the Supreme Court. It gives me a future and it gives me a hope. I don't care if no senator or no member of Congress supports this. We bypass them. It is our duty to use Article 5. We have to stand up for ourselves. And the way we stand up for ourselves is in the state legislatures. One at a time, patiently but aggressively, we take back our country. Convention of States. It is time. Hey, everyone. Mark Meckler live coming to you uh, from my barn, literally here in Grass Valley, California. And first, I just want to appreciate you guys, you out on the West Coast for being up early here you know, on a Saturday morning. I appreciate the dedication that it takes to get up and, and to get in front of your computer and to watch something like this. Really appreciate having you guys all involved and, and online. I think that's a big deal. That says a lot to me that you would come out on a Saturday morning and do this. West Coast, it's 8 a.m. If you're out there on the East Coast or somewhere else, a little bit later, a lot of people, your day is already rolling. And and that means that you're taking time away from other things to come here to hang out, to listen to me talk about Convention of States. I want to start, though, by talking about what's going on in the country today on a more broad basis. And specifically, I want to dig in a little bit to the presidential election. You know, we've got a presidential election going on right now, and people are kind of going crazy, in my opinion. And I've seen this in the last couple of cycles. People get a little bit wild during the presidential cycle. And I know you guys know this. You've watched it yourselves. You get friends who are arguing with friends and you know Republicans arguing with Republicans. And there's a lot of heat around a presidential cycle. Again, we've seen it the last few cycles here. We saw it in the first election where President Obama was elected in the follow on election. And so you've got people who are friends who are kind of at each other's throats. And I want to encourage you, you know, whoever you're supporting in this election, whether it's Cruz or Trump or or maybe you like one of the, you know, somebody like a Kasich or you're hoping for some third guy or gal to come in. Remember that the people on the right that you might be arguing with about who's the right candidate, those are your friends, right? Those are people who also love the Constitution. Those are people who also fear for liberty and freedom in this country. And so make sure that you don't hate your friends over a presidential election. You remember that, you know, you're 80% friends. You may not agree on who the right presidential candidate is for the country, but you agree probably on almost all of the issues. And so 
don't sacrifice those friendships and those alliances if you're engaged in politics because somebody supports a different candidate. I mean, there's nothing more that our opposition loves than to watch us divided. And you know the old saying, a house divided can't stand, right? So we've got to stand together to fight for the Constitution. I also want to discuss about the presidential election and, and whether it's important and how important it is. I think they're always important. We always want somebody who's conservative in the White House rather than somebody who's not. Personally, generally speaking, I'd way rather have a Republican in the White House than have a Democrat in the White House. I can tell you, as if it came to voting for Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton, I'd rather vote for a can of soda. So I know how important it is to put a Republican in the White House and hopefully you get a good Republican in the White House and we maintain a Republican Senate and House. And that allows us to slow down the deterioration of the Republic. But I want you to pay attention to the words I'm using there when I when I say what will happen with getting a new president, we will slow down the deterioration of the Republic if we get a good president. We won't prevent it from falling apart. And history shows us this. This is not pessimism on my part. This is just history, right? If you look at the history of the Republic, you look at the Republic under Democratic presidents, under Republican presidents, there is one constant. And the constant is government grows. Government power grows. The larger the government, the smaller the citizen. That's absolutely constant throughout history. Now, a lot of us remember, old enough to remember Ronald Reagan as our president, the great conservative icon, Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan installed a cabinet secretary for the Department of Education, whose task, whose goal, whose mandate was to get rid of the Department of Education and the Department of Education. It's an incredible goal. I know a lot of you are in favor of that. Most of us believe that there's nowhere in the Constitution that the federal government has the authority to deal with education in America. Thomas Jefferson himself said in order for the federal government to deal with education, there would have to be a constitutional amendment. So Reagan knew that. Reagan was a good conservative. Reagan put in a cabinet secretary to get rid of the Department of Education. And at the end of the Reagan administration, the Department of Education was bigger than it was when it started. These things are behemoths. They take on a life of their own. Reagan himself said, there's nothing closer on this earth to eternal life than a government department, a federal government department. And so that was proved out during his term. And during his term, government actually grew. So you would think a guy like Reagan with a cabinet secretary like he installed, a, a whole cabinet uh, with a Congress to work with like he had, that we would have shrank government. But that's just not the nature of government. The founders knew this, right? The founders knew that government always grows, that government always wants to centralize because that's human nature and government's just made up of human beings. You know, I have this fantasy that we would get a good conservative president in place and that that president would take the oath of office and that we would hear a speech, something like this. So in January of 2017, we are going to inaugurate a new president one way or the other. I hope it's a good conservative president. I hope that we are listening to the president give their inaugural address and they're going to place their hand on that Bible and take the oath of office. And then after they take the oath of office, what I hope is we hear a speech something like this, or they address the American public and they say, my fellow citizens, we're living at a time that we've reached a historic crossroads in America. We've reached a time when the federal government has outgrown all size and scope ever imagined by the founders. We've reached a crossroads where the bounds imposed upon the federal government by the Constitution have all been broken. And today we come to that crossroads and I'm inaugurated as your new president. And it's my intent to spend the next four years doing everything in my power and working with you, the people, to reduce the power of the presidency itself, to reduce the power of Congress and to reduce the power of the Supreme Court over the lives of the average American citizen. And I intend to work to return that power to you, the sovereign citizen. You know, I love that. I love sitting here with my feet up on my desk in the office and thinking about that kind of inaugural address. And then I smile because I know it's not going to happen. No president is going to give that inaugural address. No president, no matter how good we think they are philosophically or what a great conservative they are, because that's just not human nature. The best of them believe that they can solve a lot of the problems of America from Washington, D.C. You know, we have this debate. Is it is it uh, some kind of replacement for Obamacare? Is it Obamacare? I don't want to replace Obamacare. I just want to go back to free markets. I want to let the markets decide. And, and folks, I can tell you from spending way too much time in Washington, D.C., that there are very few people in Washington, D.C. that believe that you should decide. And that's really the fundamental question facing Americans today. It's not who should be president. It's not what should we do as a federal government, as a federal society. 
the real fundamental question facing America today is who decides? I've been in a lot of states over the last couple of years, 34 states last year alone, 12 states this year so far. And I can tell you, I ask a lot of the people that question. I ask people, do you believe that you in your own community, in your own church, your city, your county, your state should decide? Or would you rather have those decisions made for you far away, thousands of miles away, perhaps in Washington, D.C.? And I can tell you, regardless of people's political philosophy, regardless of what party they belong to, regardless of their ideology, regardless of whether they're involved in politics or not, they all say, no, they don't want Washington, D.C. to decide. They want to decide themselves. The most common answer when you ask people who should decide is they say me for my own family, us in our own community, our state here at home. We don't trust Washington, D.C. I mean, you see the ratings on Congress. Nobody trusts Washington, D.C., right? I think colonoscopies are more popular than Washington, D.C. The reality is people trust themselves at home. They trust their own government closer to home. And that's the way the founders always intended it to be. And so we can get all riled up about the presidential election, and we should work as hard as we can to elect the most conservative president we can, hopefully somebody that follows the Constitution. But there is a bigger, deeper problem in America today, and that problem is a structural problem. Structure matters. The rules of the game matter. And unfortunately, since the time of the founders, the rules of the game in America have been radically changed. Luckily, the founders gave us a solution for this. They gave us Article 5 of the United States Constitution. And Article 5 is the article that gives us the power to amend the Constitution should we deem it necessary. And the history is important here. During that convention in 1787, as the Constitution was being drafted, originally the only thing that was in there was the power for us, the people, to amend the Constitution by calling a convention of states. But by the time the final draft was done, Two days before the end of the convention, our power as the people to amend the Constitution had been removed. And the only thing that was in the document was the power of the federal government to propose amendments according to Article 5. Luckily for us, and I think providentially, George Mason stood up at the end of the convention on September 15, 1787. Kind of easy for me to remember. It's my wife's birthday. So September 15, 1787, Mason stands up and he addresses the assembled men there and he says, we have a fundamental flaw in the document that we've drafted. And the flaw is this. The flaw is that we've given the power to the federal government to propose amendments should we deem them necessary, but we have not given that same power to the states. And he, when he said this, I imagine everybody sitting around kind of slapping their heads if we had video and saying, well, of course, we've got to give the power to the people acting through the states. And so he proposed a change to the document there two days before the end of that convention. The change was to give us, to give you and me and our neighbors the power acting through acting through our state legislatures to call for a convention and then to propose amendments specifically, he said, to restrain federal tyranny. He asked a question of the men assembly. He asked if they believed that a government that becomes a tyranny would ever propose amendments to restrain its own tyranny. I mean, it's so obvious the answer to that question is no. No tyranny has ever worked to restrain its own tyranny. It takes outside forces. So this was the balance that was created. The second clause of Article 5 was put in to allow us, the people acting through our state legislatures, to call a convention, to propose amendments, to put those amendments out for ratification to the people by 38 states, and then those amendments become part of the Constitution of the United States. So those men knew that we would need this, that in this moment we would need this. And here we are. I think in this moment, 72% of Americans today say that the federal government is too big and does too much. People will try to turn this into a partisan issue, right? But if you say 72% of Americans say something, that's the majority. That's not just Republicans. It's not just conservatives. You're talking Republicans, independents, Democrats. You're talking left, right, and center, libertarians. We're all sick and tired of the federal government intruding on our lives. I hear this everywhere I go, all over the country, regardless of which party I'm talking to, regardless of where people live, people are tired of the federal government intruding in their lives. The majority of Americans today say that the federal government has actually lost its legitimacy, that it no longer represents us. So to me, that means we have to do something to change the rules of the game. The only thing that we have given to us by the founders, short of revolution, is Article 5, right? This is a peaceful revolution. This is the most reasonable, radical solution available. And I do think it's reasonable, and I do think it allows us to radically impose the fixes that are necessary here in the United States of America. 
And so this is really important. What can we do? How to, first of all, how does Article 5 work? For those of you that are not necessarily really familiar with Article 5 and how it works, let's remove the mystery because it's pretty simple. Basically, the way it works is 34 states are required to pass resolutions in both houses of their state legislatures calling for a convention, and this is critical, calling for a convention on the same subject matter, right? So there have been lots of calls for convention over the years. Over 400 applications have been put into the federal government for a convention. But what we've never had is two-thirds of the states or 34 states put in calls that are identical. This is really important. In order for those calls to aggregate to 34, they have to be identical. And so in this case now, we're, we are proposing 30, 34 states get together and propose an Article 5 application that essentially says this. There are three subject matter areas that are allowed to be talked about. And here are the three subject matter areas. Number one is to talk about things that would impose fiscal restraints on the federal government. <clears throat> so by that, I mean things like restraints on spending, restraints on taxing. Uh, you can't spend more than a certain amount of GDP. A lot of people, over roughly 80% of Americans, support a balanced budget amendment. You can propose a balanced budget amendment here. You can propose it with spending caps and taxation caps, so they can't just bust that by taxing us to death, right? You could propose uh, scope and jurisdiction restraints on the federal government. This, for me, honestly, is the most important one. Be nice to get a balanced budget amendment. That's not going to preserve our religious liberties. That's not going to preserve our property rights. That's not going to prevent the federal government from regulating small business out of existence in America. So it's really important that we impose scope and jurisdictional restraints on the federal government. And let me give you a specific example of that. In 1787, when the original constitution was, was uh, passed out of the convention, we had something in there called the Interstate Commerce Clause. That still exists. It was a narrow power given to the federal government to regulate trade between the states. And specifically, it was intended to regulate the shipment of goods across state lines. This is what the founders understood it to mean. And this is what's incredible. Today, the Supreme Court has interpreted it to mean this, to mean that the federal government can regulate any kind of business anywhere if it crosses state lines in any way. In fact, today, the, the Supreme Court says not doing business is commerce because you're not buying things in interstate commerce. So this commerce clause power that was meant to be this little tiny narrow power now gives the federal government expansive power. It allows the government to have something called the Department of Education or the Department of Energy. These are things that would have never been authorized under the original interpretation of the Commerce Clause as the founders intended. So under the second part of applying for a convention, we have the ability to discuss the scope of the Commerce Clause and potentially to redefine the Commerce Clause so that it goes back to the original meaning, the federal government has the power to regulate the shipment of goods across state lines. So you could really do some really important limitations on the scope, power, and jurisdiction of the federal government through this second part of the application. The third part of the application allows us to discuss term limits. Now, this is an amazing thing to me. 80% of Americans have wanted term limits on their congressional delegations at least for the last 30 years. Congress won't ever impose term limits on themselves. Can you imagine the guys in Congress sitting around and saying, hey, let's pass out a term limits application. Let's get the states to vote on term limits so they can kick us out of Washington, D.C. Whether you're a fan of term limits or not, if 80% of Americans want it, you got to believe we should at least have that discussion. All different kinds of term limits could be imposed. Rotation in office, maybe they go in for two terms and they have to leave for two terms before they could go back. Maybe they do three terms and then never go back. All kinds of term limits could be imposed. More importantly to me, honestly, I think, is term limits on the Supreme Court, and that is available under our application. You know, when the founders uh, instituted the Supreme Court and the federal courts, they never intended for people to serve on those courts for 25, 30 years like we're getting right now. In fact, average age of appointment was around 47 in the Founders Day and average life expectancy was about 54. So they expected five, six, seven years of service on the court maximum and then those people would rotate off. Well, today, you get 20, 30 years, you appoint a jurist to the Supreme Court and there's influence on the Supreme Court that's almost multi-generational. It was never intended to be that way. So under our third part of our application, you could impose term limits on the Supreme Court. So again, three areas are being proposed in this application. Number one, to propose uh, financial limitations, fiscal restraints on the federal government. Two is to impose scope and jurisdictional restraints on the federal government. And three is to potential imposition of term limits on the federal government. You could read more about this on our website. It's all there. The ap actual application is there on the website. So you can go take a look at that. 
So really importantly now is how's the process work? So when, when two thirds of the states or 34 states make application to Congress, then Congress has one duty. It says it right there. It says Congress shall, it's not a question, it's not a maybe, it's not if they want to, Congress shall name the time and place for convention. So I expect because they are Congress and they are Congress critters, I expect that they're gonna name the time uh, and the place for Washington, D.C. I also expect that the states will get together in Washington, D.C., convene. Every state leader I've talked to says they will then vote to move the convention somewhere else. Hopefully, I would expect somewhere in the middle of the country, you know, a Dallas or an Oklahoma City or a Kansas City, someplace that's central for easybody, everybody to get to and outside the influence and the purview of Washington, D.C. So that's how it works to get into convention. And once you get into convention, each state will send its delegates. They can send as many delegates as they want in true federalist fashion. They can make up those delegates however they want. They can be state legislators, judges, they could be citizens, you name it, whatever mix they want, however many they want. But no matter what, each state gets one vote. This is really important on anything that comes out. You could send 100 people, you can send three people. Each state's going to have to come to one vote. And you'll hear people argue about this. There is no arguing about this. It is literally called a convention of states. It's not a convention of state delegates. It's a convention of states. These are sovereign states meeting. And as sovereigns, each state gets only one vote. How do we know this? It's never been any other way in American history. Believe it or not, there have been a lot of conventions in American history. There were conventions before the 1780 convention. There have been interstate conventions since the 1787 convention. There's never been a convention where it wasn't one state, one vote. That's simply how it works because otherwise no states would participate. Small states would choose not to participate. You'd never even get to a quorum. So it's one state, one vote in convention. What happens in convention? The delegates debate. They debate in these three subject matter areas. I expect every state is going to bring a slate of things that they would like to discuss, amendments they think are needed under those three subject matter areas. The delegates will meet in probably a committee and debate. They'll meet on floor in debate with all the delegates that are there. And ultimately, hopefully, what they're going to do is pass out a slate of amendments that come out of that convention. They're probably going to do that by simple majority, so 26 states. And when those things come out, I think this is really important to remember, they are suggestions. They're not amendments. They don't do anything to the Constitution. Nothing happens after convention that is binding on anybody in any way, except a slate of amendments go out to the states for ratification. According to the Constitution, it takes 38 states to ratify, three quarters of the states. So you need the legislatures, a majority of the legislatures in 38 states to ratify. Now, you're going to hear a lot of people talk about the idea of a runaway convention. And I smile when I say this because it is so absurd and the idea is so ridiculous that you just can't take it seriously. Because what they're telling you is that they believe that the 13 most conservative states in America are going to do something crazy to take away your rights. So let me explain that math a little bit. If it takes 13 states, uh, 38 states to ratify, that means it takes only 13 states to stop anything, right? So this is really important because if 13 states don't do it, you never get to 38. And by the way, by not ratifying doesn't even mean you vote against it. It means you just never even discuss it. It doesn't ever have to be brought up in a legislative committee. It never has to be voted on. So the people who want to scare you away from using your right, your sovereign right under Article 5, they will tell you that the 13 most conservative states in America are going to vote to take away your guns, vote to take away your religious liberties. Now, remember, I'm not talking about crazy left-leaning states like my state of California. When they tell you that you could lose your gun rights under an Article 5 convention, what they're telling you is states like Texas and Louisiana, Georgia, Mississippi, Tennessee, the Carolinas, Nebraska, Wyoming, that states like this are going to vote to take away your guns. They're going to vote to take away your religious liberties. And you got to laugh. I mean, honestly, that's just completely absurd and ridiculous. The most conservative states were set up and the way the system was set up is a high bar. Those states are a bulwark against anything crazy happening in convention. And to be fair, if you have friends on the left that are scared about this, you can't get anything too radically conservative out of it either because the 13 most liberal states are going to stop something that would be a radical swing. What you're going to get out of it are common sense reforms that all Americans want. Remember, 72% of Americans say the federal government is too big and does too much. So that big middle, the 72% middle, they want term limits. They want a balanced budget amendment. They want the federal government to stop regulating their businesses to death. 
right? And it's regulating our society to death and imposing their fixes on us nationally. So you're gonna get common sense reforms coming from the states, then proposed back out to the states for ratification. That's how the whole process works. So some people say this is a big fantasy. It could never happen. It's impossible. I hear that word all the time. This is impossible because we've never done it. Well, number one, I wanna to say to anybody who says this is impossible, America was built on the impossible. We're the impossible nation. We shouldn't even exist if you say we can't do things that are impossible, right? We fought a war against the greatest military power, the greatest empire in the history of the earth against the British Empire. A bunch of ragtag militias got together and organized and fought that fight, and we beat them. We were founded on the impossible. We've done the impossible time after time. We went overseas and fought a war in Europe in World War II. It was impossible for us to win that war. Overseas, right? Supplier troops overseas, an incredible daunting task. We did it because it was right. We did it because I think it's providence. We were driven by liberty. We were driven by the idea of individual freedom. And we did it because we are a nation built on doing the impossible. So if people tell you this is impossible, just smile and say, yeah, you know, We've always done the impossible. Americans have always come together in a time of need and done the impossible to save the Republic. And now it is time to save the Republic. So let's talk about our current state of affairs. This is not just some pipe dream, it's actually in action. And let's talk about all the incredible stuff that's happened. You know, when this project was launched a couple of years ago, if you had told me that people like Mark Levin and Sean Hannity and Rush Limbaugh would talk about Article 5 positively, I'd have thought it was a joke. I figured it would take us years to get people like that on board. But Mark Levin wrote the book, Liberty Amendments. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it about this whole process and why we need to do it. And Rush said we need to do it. And Hannity said we need to do it. And Beck talked about it and all kinds of people. You can go across the country. You can look at radio talk show hosts all across the country, conservative television personalities all across the country. You can look at professors like Randy Barnett at Georgetown like Robbie George at Princeton. You can look on our website and look at the Jefferson Statement. The Jefferson Statement, you'll see all these great scholars that got together and said, they're not worried about a runaway convention and we need to do this right now. So the most amazing thing to me that's happened is what started as a little germ of an idea in Mike Ferris's head has now become this national phenomenon and this national movement. Over 1.2 million people now involved at various levels in the Convention of States project all over the country. You know, I come out of the Tea Party movement and I can tell you it was, it's an incredible blessing to have been involved in that movement, to have helped found the largest organization in the movement, Tea Party Patriots. And I never thought I'd see that kind of thing again. But we're seeing it again with the Convention of States movement. Lots of people who are not Tea Partiers are involved in the Convention of States movement. Lots of people, I would say 60 to 70 percent of people who are now involved in the Convention of States movement were not even involved in politics before a whole new different kind of people. And I think the reason is these are people who are really looking for a plan. When we did the Tea Party movement, it was really important. I think we changed the face and complexion of American politics, but we didn't really have a plan. We were complained a lot. We were angry a lot about what was going on. We even helped elect some people, but we didn't have a laid out, firm, solid, executable plan like we have with Convention of States now. So that's really changing things in American politics. Are the politicians listening? You bet they are. Every single Republican presidential candidate at some point has talked about this, except for Donald Trump. You look at the people who've spoken positively about the use of Article 5. We had Bobby Jindal actually endorse the Convention of States project. And you had Mike Huckabee actually endorse the Convention of States project. Ben Carson said he's in support of the Convention of States project. Sarah Palin endorsed the Convention of States project. You got Ted Cruz talks positively about the use of Article 5. Kasich positive on the use of Article 5. Jeb Bush, even before he stepped out of the race, positive on the use of Article 5. So all the candidates who've weighed in, with the exception of Donald Trump, who hasn't weighed in on the issue, all of them in favor of use of Article 5, because they all know that even if you elect them president, they can't do what it takes to save the country. So it's going to take us using Article 5 to save the country. Now I want to talk about the difficult part of saving the country under this. So that's all the positive parts. So we've gone out in the states. We've now passed it in six states around the country. Both houses have passed it. The last two were Tennessee and Indiana, but here's the difficult part. And one of the things that honestly, I didn't realize how difficult these state legislatures are to move. So you get into the state legislatures and you could have a whip count where you've got enough senators or enough house members, assembly members, delegates, whatever they're called in a given state to pass your application. 
But sometimes what happens is you get into a committee and you've got one person against you and they're the deciding vote on the committee. These committees, by the way, usually split Republican, Democrat down the line, but occasionally you get a Republican that peels off and votes for the status quo, votes for bigger federal government, votes for allowing the federal government to continue to rule our lives and run our lives. I mean, I call these guys the constitutional crackpots. They think they're protecting the Constitution. And instead, what they're doing is they're continuing the status quo and allowing the federal government to run our lives. You get one or two of them to peel off and we lose in a committee and it never makes it to the floor. Or you get somebody who's just obstinate. I'll give you a perfect example. In Arizona right now, we believe we have the votes to pass it in the Senate. I think that's consistently true. We've passed it in the House the last three years. There's one guy in the Senate, Senate President Andy Biggs, one of the biggest constitutional crackpots in America, in my opinion, he won't even let the thing get to a vote. So you get these tyrants, these mini tyrants in the state legislatures who stop it. So we're at six states, we're shooting for 34. The biggest problem is getting past these committees. We're doing better and better. Right? We've gotten past more committee hearings this year than we've have in the past two years. Really incredible progress, but we need you. We've got a lot of you, 1.2 million. We need a lot more of you. We need you in the fight for this. So that's that's the difficult part of it. You know, you might be watching and thinking, well, what role can I actually play in this? Is there something that I could actually do to make a difference? And the answer is yes, really, only you could make a difference. You don't have to be sitting here on a video or leading an organization like I do in order to make the difference. What you need to do is be involved at whatever level you can. As I said, there's 1.2 million people involved. If you're not involved yet, you get involved, become a district captain for us. And if you want to really get seriously involved, you can step up and try to become a state director, or a legislative liaison, or you could just volunteer to help. Tell your friends about it, spread it around on the internet. But the truth is we need you. People like you founded this country. And I think we forget that sometimes. Oh, I'd like to tell you a little story about how the country was founded. And, and it's a story that isn't told much. And I think it's the most important story of the American Revolution. See, because the American Revolution is not really actually a story about George Washington, or Sam Adams, or John Adams, or, or Madison. That's not really the real story of the American Revolution. That's the story of great men who fought in the American Revolution, great leaders in the American Revolution. But the majority of people who participated in the American Revolution, I think were just as great, just as important. There are people like you and me. They were farmers, they were shopkeepers, right? Merchants, just regular folks raising their families, didn't really want to fight a war, didn't have heads full of big patriotic ideas. They just wanted to be left alone. They just answered the question, who decides by saying, I should decide, my family should decide. And suddenly this benign power far away that had left them alone for a very long time was imposing on them and saying, we can tell you to do anything we want to tell you to do and you will do it. You'll pay whatever taxes we say. You'll follow whatever laws we say. You really have no choice in the matter. Those will come from a parliament far away. And the American people said no. And a great example of this is the story of Captain Levi Preston. This story is recounted. You can find it on the internet. It's told by Mellon Chamberlain. Mellon was a young historian traveling the country, collecting the stories of the last remaining Minutemen, the American patriots who'd actually fought in, this, in the American Revolution. And remember, th these folks at the time, by the way, that Preston is collecting the stories around the 1840s, they're in their late 80s, early 90s. And we may know people that age now, but that was incredibly rare back then when the average life expectancy was 54. And Chamberlain knows that if he doesn't collect these stories, then they're going to be lost to history forever. There's no YouTube, right? People can't record selfie videos or audios or... You know, most people didn't even write this kind of stuff down about themselves because people back then, they were much more humble. It wasn't considered appropriate for most of these guys to write autobiographies or something like that. So Chamberlain's going around the country collecting these stories, and he happens across Captain Levi Preston in the great state of North Carolina. Preston had fought at the original battle at Concord Bridge. And so Chamberlain wants to know, what is it that brought him out to fight, right? Why would you do that? And so he asks him a series of questions, questions that he had asked out of the other Minutemen as well. And he says, Captain Preston, why is it that you went on the field of battle that day to fight against the Red Coast, the greatest fighting force ever assembled in history? What brought you out as a farmer and a family man with everything to lose? And he asks him first, was it the Stamp Act, right? Were you tired of having to buy those stamps and place them on your documents and pay the tax that goes with them? Preston says, I never saw one of them. The governor locked him in the armory and that's the last we ever heard of it. 
So of course, Chamberlain's a little bit confused by this. He says, what about the tea tax? Were you frustrated with paying the tax on tea, taxation without representation and all that? Preston says, never paid any of it. We didn't drink any tea. I was a farmer. We drank coffee. And so he doesn't know about that. And he's, he says, by the way, he knew that the boys dumped it all in the harbor and he thought that was kind of funny, but that was pretty much the end of the tea tax. And he asked him if he was reading the great revolutionaries and Locke and all people like that. And he says, no, never heard of those men. We read the Bible, Almanac, Psalms. That was about it, those of us who could read. And so it wasn't the great revolutionaries. And so Chamberlain's confused. And he goes big and he says, maybe it was the heavy hand of British tyranny. Maybe you were just tired of living under tyranny. And Preston says, and I think this sums it up better than anybody. He's asked, well, why would you fight if it wasn't those men? If you hadn't read those men, you didn't know any of the stuff. You weren't feeling oppressed. And he says, son, when we went out to face them redcoats that day, we meant only one thing. We had always governed ourselves and we always meant to. And them redcoats, they meant that we shouldn't. And I think that sums up the whole theory and philosophy, political philosophy of the American Revolution better than anything else you could ever read. We'd always governed ourselves and we'd always meant to. I can tell you today, largely in America, most of us don't feel like we have the power to govern ourselves. You know, we're frustrated. They pass laws that we don't agree with. They shove their values down our throats. New, whatever it is, New York values for, for Idaho and they're shoving California values for Alabama, Washington, D.C. values for everybody, right? So they believe that all of us should believe exactly the same. And they believe that if we don't, they're going to force us to believe exactly the same from some distant capital far away in Washington, D.C. This is the structure that we have today in the United States of America. It's really not about who we put in office. It's about a structure that allows them to do that. Originally, the structure wouldn't have allowed it. There's no way the Supreme Court back in 1787 or 1789 or 1790, no way the Supreme Court would have made decisions giving the federal government the vast power that it has today. Today, the Supreme Court tells us you know, who, who can get married, that there's a right, some special right to people getting married in the Constitution that I can't find in that Constitution. There's all kinds of stuff that they've invented in the Constitution that never was intended to be in there. The federal government has assumed vast powers the founders wouldn't ever recognize. and wouldn't have recognized, nobody would have recognized for the first hundred years of this country. So the question is today that's facing us, what do we do about it? And my argument is right there in the Constitution, the founders wrote a note to us 239 years ago. They wrote a note to us saying, this time will come. The time will come when the federal government exceeds all bounds ever imposed upon it by the Constitution. The time will come for the American people to rise up against those who would rule them from a faraway city. And today is that time. You see it unfolding in the election. The reason people want outsiders is we don't trust the people in D.C. anymore. We want to change. We've been push, pushing for this change in government strongly since at least 2010. 2010, the largest turnover in electoral history since the 1930s, right? 2014, then we give this Republicans the Senate, right? And what changes out of that? The answer is very little to nothing changes out of it. That's because the structure today is broken. And if we're going to fix the government, if we're going to save the Republic, as I believe it is our solemn right to do, if we're going to save the Republic, then you and me, your neighbors, your family, your employers, your friends, your coworkers, we're going to have to step up and do it. They're not going to do it for us in Washington, D.C. And I fully believe not only can we, not only should we, but we have a moral obligation to do it. Our founders shed their blood so that we would have this great country with all this freedom. And in the generation since, many have shed their blood and many have died to keep that liberty, to maintain that liberty for us. Today, we have men and women in the armed forces who take an oath, and that oath says that they're willing to die for that Constitution, for the Constitution that gives you and I the liberty. So the least we can do if we're not part of those armed forces is to stand up and to fight here, to fight according to the Constitution, to use the Constitution to save the Constitution. Not only do I believe that we have a moral obligation to do it, not only do I believe that we can, but I firmly believe we will. I have faith in the American people. 
I've been in 34 states in the last year, 12 states this year already. I know what you're made of. I know who you are. Whether you're in Tennessee or Georgia or New York or Massachusetts or Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky, wherever you are out here in the West, the great Western states, Colorado, Northwest in Washington, or even in my state of California that people think is so politically crazy. I meet great patriots just like you all across the country. That's why when I hear people on the news talk about how dark and dismal it is, I just can't relate because I know the great patriots that inhabit this country. They're not the people that you mostly see on the news. They're not mostly what you see broadcast from New York or Washington, D.C. You're the great patriots that make up the country. And if you ever feel alone, don't because no, you're everywhere, literally in every state, whether you think that's a liberal state like Illinois or California, trust me, there are great patriots there too. Up in New York, where you might think, oh, it's just crazy in New York, and you hear about the craziness in New York or California. In New York, go to upstate New York. See what it's like out in the country, the real hardworking Americans. Go to the center of the country, to the farm belt, and see what it's like, the great Americans there. Go to the Central Valley of California. You see, 85% of California geographically is conservative, great American patriots just like you. So I have great hope and great optimism for this country. And we have our hands on the tool. And that tool is Article 5. So I thank you guys for coming today, for having this conversation with me, for talking, listening to me talk about Article 5. But it's not enough for me just to talk because it's really important that we have dialogue. And one of the reasons that I like this Hangout environment is because it allows us to dialogue a little bit. We can't have live video chat with so many people on, but we can have dialogue. And so one of the things I want to do here is I'm going to open up the Q&A session on this. And basically, the way this is going to work is you're going to see Q&A uh, pop up. I think it's on the bottom third of the screen, and it's going to give you the opportunity to post questions. And you're going to have to forgive me. It's a little bit uh, burdensome for me to have to go back and forth. So I'm going to have to read questions and then answer your questions. I'll do the best to get to as many questions as I can. All right. Basically, the way it works is if you're watching using YouTube or on our website, you click on the gray eye in the right corner of the video. You click on the second option down there, and that'll open. Uh, that's if you to get your Hangout page open. And then you go to the Q&A option. You click on the button with the squares, and you'll see the Q&A option. Or you can also post on our Facebook or Twitter accounts if you happen to be using those right now. And we got some of our staff that are monitoring those things, so they'll go take a look at those. So I'm going to go over to the, the questions over here and start to take a look at those and see if I can do my best to answer some questions for you. So the first question is uh, from Kadel on Twitter. Are we getting any liberals on board? We, won't we need liberal states to get three quarters of the states needed for ratification? The answer is uh, we, we won't necessarily need liberal states, though I'd like to get them on board, but we do need what I would describe as moderate states. So today in America, you have the way that it lays out in the state legislatures, 31 states with both houses controlled by Republicans. And then you've got eight states uh, with both where the houses are split and 11 states with both houses controlled by Democrats. So in order to get this to work, we need the 31 states with both houses controlled by Republicans and three of the eight states where you've got split houses. And so, of course, that means you do need Democrats. I, I won't say necessarily liberals because uh, the ideology isn't as relevant, but you definitely need some Democrats. And we do have Democrats on board. Ohio is a great example. We have two primary sponsors in Ohio. One of them is Bill Patman, who's a Democrat from Ohio, and he is a co-sponsor of this bill. And the reason is whether we agree ideologically on what needs to be done to fix the country, Democrats like Patman believe that we should take the power away from Washington, D.C. and give it back to the people, right, and give it back to the states. So we do have Democrats on board, and we have some Democrats voting for us, a very small minority to be fair, but some Democrats voting for us in state legislatures around the country. So the answer to your question fundamentally is we're going to need some states that have some split legislatures. We're going to need some Democrats on board. We're working on that. And there are plenty of Democrats who believe that we should bring the power back to the states. They might not agree on what the, the resolution should be once we get the power back into the states, what the policy should be. But in California, for example, a very liberal state, I still want the power back here in California. They're going to do stuff a lot more liberal than I would like but I still want that power back here. Remember, the fundamental question isn't what should we do, it's who decides. Okay, let's see. Um, the, se the next question I've got is, uh, this is from Steve uh, Boson. The question is, 
What's your read on getting the other states needed on board to call for a convention? I'm specifically asking for a read on a timeline because I believe we're running out of time to get this done. I do. I agree with you, Steve. I do think we're running out of time to get it done. My timeline goes something like this. It kind of depends on how desperate things get in America. The more desperate it gets, the faster the timeline gets. The more people believe that things are working out and they're going to get a solution out of Washington, D.C., the slower the timeline is. So there are some things that could radically accelerate. I believe that if uh, we get a Democratic nominee who is then elected president, Hillary, Bernie, however you think that plays out, I think that radically accelerates the timeline. Because I think there are a lot of folks out there that might be scared of holding a convention that are going to be more scared of a Hillary presidency or a Bernie presidency. So I'm my realistic timeline is I'm hoping no more than two years to get this finished off. It's long, slow, difficult, arduous work. But I think that can be accelerated. I don't mean that I want, by the way, that I want a leftist president. I don't. But I think it does accelerate the timeline. Now, if you get a good conservative president in there, I think it will accelerate the timeline as well, but more slowly. And here's why I say that, because I think a good conservative president is going to get in there and try to do as many of the right things as they can, but they're not going to shrink government. Government is out of control. These, these agencies have a life of their own. They're not going to take kindly to the pushback. Remember that government is uh, filled with human beings. Those human beings, a lot of them belong to unions. Those unions are in favor of larger government. Human beings don't want to see their own jobs cut. So government itself is invested in bigger government. And so it's we've shown, history has shown it's impossible for them to do it. So if you get a guy or a gal in the presidency that's conservative and they try to do these things and it doesn't work out and they fail, again, that also is an argument for accelerating the process. So I'm going to say, I'm going to be optimistic. I'm going to say realistically two years, maybe sooner if we get a catastrophe, but I'm not wishing for a catastrophe. Okay, the next question is, uh, how can this off Twitter? How can I fight DC and make a difference if I don't have any experience working in politics? You know, this goes back to the Levi Preston story. He didn't have any experience as a soldier. And I've been now engaged in this fight for seven years. When I started in the Tea Party movement, I had zero experience in politics. The only thing I did was vote. And honestly, embarrassingly, I didn't always do that because I felt like my vote didn't matter. So there were primaries and stuff I didn't vote in, probably even the occasional general election. I, you know, I just was rationally apathetic. But what I can tell you is you get involved and you get involved at the level that you can get involved at. In other words, get involved in Convention of States. Go to the website, sign up. If you want to get involved, you know, read, learn, start to talk to your friends about it. If you want to get involved at a higher level, volunteer to become a district captain. There's really not that much involved in it. And so the way to fight back against D.C. is to take the power away from D.C. I think one of the reasons a lot of us don't get involved is because we think there's really nothing I can do. I'm just one person, right? I can't make that much of a difference because it's just me. And the truth is, the only thing that's ever made a difference is a bunch of people who originally thought that way, deciding they were going to get involved. So fighting back against DC, the best method I know is convention of states because we're here to take the power away from Washington, DC. Okay, the next question I've got uh, comes from Brandon Benson. It says, there's so much attention on the political presidential cycle, and that's important. But people say we just need to elect the right president. What do we say to people who think we just need to depend on elections? You know that old saying about uh, the definition of insanity is to do the same thing and expect a different result? That's generally what I say. And especially if we look at the last six to eight years, right? So in 2010, we did get involved in elections, a lot of us, right? Record numbers of us got involved, especially record numbers of conservatives. And we elected the largest swing class in Congress since 1938. I was part of that. I was really excited to be involved in that. I know a lot of you were too. And we expected some pretty fundamental change. And those that class went to Washington, D.C. with really high expectations. I mean, remember, the House controls the power of the purse. They can pretty much stop anything they want to stop. And so they got in there and they dug in and then exactly nothing happened. There were some surface fights. There was some theater that went on. They didn't even stop the debt ceiling increases from happening. And when they fought the debt ceiling, they didn't even get any concessions for raising the debt ceiling. It was incredible. It was incredibly frustrating, right? So then we continued to fight and continued to fight. Unfortunately, Barack Obama's reelected. 
2012 and 2014. Now we've heard Congress telling us for a long time, look, all we have is the House. If we got the Senate, everything would be different and everything would be changing, right? And so people like you and me, we got engaged, we went out, we worked for candidates, we definitely voted, people gave money, people knocked on doors, and lo and behold, the Senate was delivered to the Republicans with very high hopes. Now, both houses of Congress controlled by Republicans and great expectations as we went into the next session and got exactly nothing. Nothing changed. So if you believe that elections are the way to change things, well, just look at recent history. We made big changes in the elections and nothing changed because the institutions themselves didn't change. Because the rule set that is stacked against us, the citizens, stayed exactly the same. Because this crazy interpretation of the Constitution as this big, giant power machine for Washington, D.C. didn't change. So D.C. continued to do what it did despite elections. And that's where we're at today. That's why people are so frustrated. So I'm not telling you don't go elect good people. Go elect good people. Elect the best people you possibly can. We should definitely always be engaged in elections. That's our base level obligation as citizens. But we better have a better plan because I'll tell you, I have a son who's in the U.S. Marines, and I can't tell him my plan is to continue electing better people and then failing to change the government. I can't do that to him because he's willing to put his life online for the Constitution. We have to have a bigger, better plan. Convention of States is that plan. Okay, let's see. Uh, next, I've got somebody says, uh, this is, uh, let's see. I've learned so much about the legality of the federal government, but no one talks about the fact that we're paying illegal taxes and that lawyers who are sworn to the bar are taking uh, oath, they're taking their office illegally. How do we educate Americans? Well, the key to educating Americans is to get them involved, right? People have to believe that they need an education before they get educated. And this is a really important factor. So when you get involved in convention of states, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to provide you with all kinds of education. But I can tell you, you've got other things going on in your life. If you're like me, you got kids, you got soccer games to go to, right? You're coaching baseball, you're involved in your church group, things like that, hopefully. Maybe you sing in the choir. Maybe you even have a little bit of free time and you have some hobbies. So the idea that you're going to sit down and educate yourself on government, it's just not at the top of most people's priority list. And the way you get it to their list is you get them engaged. You give them something that inspires them. Then they want to start talking about it. And then they have a need for education. If you're going to talk to your friends about Convention of States, you're going to feel a little bit self-conscious about it if you don't know anything about it. So what we do is we give people something that inspires them. You call them to a fight that inspires them. In this case, what I'm telling you is we have a fight here in front of us where you can tell people that without the permission of Congress, without electing the quote unquote right people to Congress or the right president, you can bypass Congress, the president and the Supreme Court, and you can throttle them down. You can restrain them. You, the regular citizen. That's just a fact. And when you tell people that, then they're interested and then they become educated. So it's interesting people in being engaged in the fight first and then they want the education. So you can't just pour education at them and expect them to eat it up. You got to interest them in an exciting fight first. Okay, let's see. Uh, this is from Jay Corbett on Twitter. Do you believe Ted Cruz as president of the United States will promote the COS project? Do you believe he'll recommend it to we the people? Uh, you know, this is a little bit of a tough question for me. And I say that because I think uh, of all the candidates who ran for, for the presidential nomination on the Republican side, Ted Cruz is clearly the constitutionalist among them. This is the guy that I think understands the Constitution better than any of the other candidates that ran on the Republican side. This is the guy that promotes and believes in fidelity to the Constitution more than anybody on that side. But I'm going to give a big caveat. He's sort of equivocated on this. And he recently did an interview, and I saw this, where he says that um, he, he definitely believes in Article 5, and he thinks that we need amendments, and he specifically points to the balanced budget amendment and term limits amendments and says Congress needs to propose those amendments. And he's going to work to do everything he can to get Congress to propose those amendments. I mean, if this was me to Ted, I'd say, Ted, you're hallucinating. Get over it, buddy. Go to the people. Because Congress is not going to propose amendments to restrain its own power. You can't get, even, get them even to limit the debt ceiling. And he believes we're going to put a budget cap on them. 
some kind of balanced budget process that they're going to propose that to themselves. Term limits, right? They're against term limits. They don't want to get thrown out of there. They love it there. So I, you know, I'm not sure exactly why he says that. Maybe it's from being in the Senate. He believes he can influence the Senate. The reality is Cruz didn't have much influence over the Senate. I love what he did there. I love what he stood for there. But he couldn't get them even to fight back against Obamacare. He basically stood alone, him and Mike Lee, against Obamacare in the Senate. Now he thinks he's going to get them to restrain their own power. I just don't think that's reasonable. So I hope he comes along. I believe as a constitutionalist, he believes in Article 5. But I also believe maybe his opinion is colored by being in Washington, D.C. Maybe he believes he can actually get D.C. to change. I just don't think that's correct. Okay, so um, here's a... Let's see. The YouTube user says, we live in a world where something iconic has to exist. Something big, whether it's celebrities, a video, a movie, a song, especially to reach millennials. Do you feel like you're still looking for that big thing or are you looking? And my answer to that is, you know, I agree in messaging wise, you need the right narrative. I, I would call it narrative. You need some kind of overarching narrative to reach people. Millennials tend to be tied to video as a communication methodology more than anything else. So you need you need to be able to express it in video. I think in a narrative sense, we have it in the sense that I think who decides is the real narrative. If, and I think millennials come to this narrative naturally. Uh, the millennial generation is known for being a very self-assured generation. Right? Some people say that in a negative way. In a real positive way, I think millennials believe they can change the world, and I believe they can too. And the real question is, do they want other people, old people like me, you know, average age in Washington, D.C. is older than me. Do they want people like that making the decisions for them, selling the country away for them? So I think who decides is the narrative. Do we have the big thing? Do we have the movie star talking about it or the movie about it or the song? No, we don't have that big thing. We're always looking for that big thing. A big thing is transient, too. It changes from time to time. So I'd love to see it. If you have suggestions for it, bring it on. Here's an amendment idea from somebody says, my amendment idea, this is from Deborah Lee, says three-fifths of the state legislatures can impeach and try anyone in the federal government. I don't know, first blush, I've never heard that before, but at first blush, I kind of like it. I like the idea of being able to remove people from the federal government for particular standards. Right now, those people are, are basically infinitely powerful. You almost can't remove them for anything. Uh, you can do it by voting, but incumbency has so much power, it's fairly difficult to do. And so I like the idea of an amendment for three-fifths of state legislatures could impeach people in the federal government. All right, next question. Let's see. Uh, Kayuma Havura says, as an organization that is against top-down governance, how does the leadership of COS model bottom-up governance in its own dealings within COS across the states? Well, generally speaking, here's how it works. We view ourselves as a service organization. So first and foremost, our job is to serve, and, and that comes across multiple levels. So in other words, for those of us who actually uh, work as employees of the organization, employees of the, of the 501c4 charitable organization and the 501c3 organization, for those of us, our job is to serve each other. That's one of our methods of service, right? To serve the country. Um, most of us are people of faith, so to serve God is part of our mission. But also then, fundamentally, and we talk about this literally every day our fundamental mission is to serve the grassroots and by serving the grassroots that means give them the tools give them the support give them what they need to do the things they need to do to accomplish the cos mission our teams in the states are comprised of a state director a legislative liaison in some states we have a state information analyst somebody who's in charge of the digital presence in the state helping us to watch the data helping us to help people online uh, we also have uh, district captains in the state in every state legislative district. Sometimes we divide the states into regions. Those people operate relatively autonomously. And the less help they need from us, generally the less intervention they get. Generally speaking, state strategies are built out by the state teams themselves. And so we give them sort of templates to help them do this, to figure out what their strategies are. And you can see this, that the strategies are very different in each state. It's a different approach. We'll start in the House. We'll start in the Senate. Uh, you know, we when we go after politicians, we make a decision like to go after this politician or that politician or to do a call to action among the grassroots. Those things are generally decided on by the state leadership teams. 
And those leadership teams, if it's working ideal, are consulting with their district captains and state calls and state emails. And so all of this is bubbling up from the bottom up via state leadership teams. I'll tell you, honestly, occasionally we do intervene from the national level. If we see something that we believe that would be damaging to the national movement, we feel like somebody's not not doing things or doing things that would not only be ineffective, but potentially damaging in a given state. At that point, we might intervene and try to come to consensus. But generally speaking, the plans, how they operate, the timing, the tools that they choose to use or not use within any given state are generally speaking set by the state team. So that's how we work from a bottom up perspective. Let's see. Uh, when will I appear on Levin TV? I'll appear whenever Mark asks me. If he wants me to come on, I'll come on. You know, I don't, I do talk to Mark from time to time. We do communicate by email. He's a great friend of the movement, obviously. He's talked about it on uh, Levin TV a lot about the movement. So I feel really privileged. For me, it's never about personally getting on the media. I'm privileged. I do get on the media from time to time. I try to speak for you guys when I get in the media, not for me. It's a real privilege. And I don't feel entitled to be there. So if Mark decides it's useful to the movement or useful to Levin TV to have me come on, I'll come on. But it's generally not something that I push to do. Let's see. Um, by the way, that question was from Don Sutton, if I didn't say it. Okay. So this is from Dennis Stolfi. And Dennis asked the question, in states like Arizona and South Carolina, where there might be one legislature who's holding up the other state legislators, is there pressure by those by other state legislators of those states to force that one legislature to proceed? The answer is yes, sometimes. So let me give you an example in Arizona. When you have a Senate president like Andy Biggs who operates with sort of an iron fist, the other legislators are nervous about opposing him and about going against him on something that he feels this strongly about. And the reason is, depending on how the legislature lays out, what the leadership rules are, and individual personalities and how they work, a guy like Andy Biggs can impose real serious punishment on his fellow legislators. So in Biggs's case, threats go out to all these legislators to let them know that if they oppose him on this issue, if they really try and rally around and try to use the rules to get around him on the issue, they'll lose their committee assignments, which are important. And I don't want to downplay that. I mean, I, I wish they would will, be willing to have this fight, but they work long and hard to get in charge of those committees. Those committees allow them to have some measure of power and effect in the legislature, allow them to move legislation that they think is really important. So he'll take those committee assignments away. He'll personally kill other bills that they find really important. So their district needs bill A, B, or C, the things that they've been working on, and they get, get told that we're going to kill those bills. It's not a pretty game. It's really messy. It's really ugly, and I don't like it. I hate politics generally, to be honest with you. And to watch these kind of leadership moves and, and them twist these senators' arms behind their backs, I don't like it. But I also understand these legislators have to be effective in their districts as well. They have other district, other uh, responsibilities other than just getting convention of states passed. I think that's the most important thing they can do, personally. And I'll be honest with you, if I was one of those legislators and I had a guy like Andy Biggs tell me that I'm going to kick you off all your committees and I'm going to stop all your other legislation if you don't stop pushing convention of states, I'd stand against him. I'd be willing to lose my seat in order to stand against him. But it's not for me to make that judgment call for other legislatures. But I can tell you there are legislatures where a bunch of senators or members of the House have gotten together and opposed leadership on it and been able through their collective political muscle to push it past leadership. But it, mostly it's important that we have leadership on board. I can tell you things are way, way easier in states if we get the leadership on board. Uh, the next question, uh, do you think we'll see any other governors follow the lead of Texas Governor Greg Abbott in backing Convention of States? I do think we're going to see it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Governor Greg Abbott in Texas came out to the surprise of almost everybody, to be honest with you, we didn't know it was coming, and made Convention of States his number one legislative priority in coming up in the 2017 session. They have biannual sessions, so uh, they can't do it this year, but they'll do it next year. And Abbott, but Abbott's also a unique character. It's important to remember Abbott's a lawyer. Abbott was attorney general of the state. He has sued the federal government more than any other state attorney general, 31 lawsuits against the federal government for federal government overreach. And he was also on the state Supreme Court. So he understands this stuff as well as anybody in the country. And I've spent time on the phone talking with Governor Abbott. And the reason he's engaged in this fight is he believes uh, two things. I, I think number one, to be fair, is our grassroots were incredible in Texas. 
called the governor's office, let the governor's office know we want this supported, that we'd like a special session. I mean, they really let him know that he would have the political support if he did this. And he spent the time and energy to do the research on Article 5. I would argue he knows the subject matter better than any governor in the United States, better than most people in the United States. And he decided that we're living in a time of constitutional crisis. He decided that if we don't fix this problem, that nothing else much matters. That the federal government is going to continue to impose its will on Texas and other states. And then ultimately, if you talk to Governor Abbott, it will mean the death of the republic. I agree with him on that. So I do think other governors will come along. He has had conversations with other governors. Uh, you know, I think they're slow to act on stuff like this. But I do believe with his leadership, and he's going to continue to lead, they will come along. For those of you who haven't heard, uh, I highly recommend go pre-order. He's got his book coming out on uh, Amazon. I think it comes out May 17th. It's called Broken But Unbent. For If you don't know, Governor Abbott's in a wheelchair. He had a a freak accident he was out jogging and a huge branch out of a tree fell on him and broke his spine so he's paralyzed but he's going to talk in the book about his own life and then about how he came to article five and about why he thinks that's so important so it's uh, again governor abbott's book it's on amazon right now on pre-sale i've already ordered it myself okay let's see uh i'm gonna this this is um a question about Andy Biggs, specifically in Arizona, he's leaving his post at this as president of the Arizona Senate, wondering how helpful it is to point this out to the opposition. How can we be effective in moving forward in Arizona now that Biggs is leaving? It's an Arizona specific question, but just briefly, I think with him leaving, things change dramatically in the next session. I still don't think things are, people are going to oppose him in the last couple of weeks of this session. They're generally scared of Biggs, but I think next session is going to be the we'll get it through in the next session with a different president. Here's a question. Uh, if the call of the convention is legally restricted to the scope of the Article 5 resolutions passed by the states, why don't we just say there is no way there can be a runaway convention or an impact to the Bill of Rights, period? I do say that. That's why I think it's just a joke. I mean, the call is limited. I went to the end game because, look, I'll indulge people if they want to say that they think it can run away, and I want to show them how ridiculous it is even if it did run away. But the reality is the call is limited to the scope. Any delegate to the convention is limited by their commission or the instructions they get from their state saying what they can vote on. The convention itself is legally limited. And then in the end, whatever comes out is limited by the ratification process. So yeah, I totally agree with you. The bottom line is there is no way, no way, 0% chance that you can have a runaway convention that affects the Bill of Rights. Just simply can't happen. And I say that over and over publicly. Let's see. Somebody says, completely agree on the structural reforms needed. This is Ed Smith. How does convention states do that and provide the states a voice in the federal government? Do you see repeal of the 17th Amendment as an answer? So uh, for those of you who don't know, and, and don't feel bad if you don't know, I didn't know anything about the 17th Amendment a couple of years ago. You know, we directly elect our senators. We vote for our senators in our states. The founders didn't intend it to be that way. What the founders intended was that the state legislatures would appoint their own senators, and then the senators would go to Washington, D.C., to represent the states, right? Not to represent the people of the states, but to represent the state as an entity. And primarily, if I could describe the senator's job in a single word is the senator's job was no. To say no to the federal government, to say, no, you can't do that, that's our job. No, you can't do that, we have the authority to do that, you don't do that. And that's what senators were meant to do until the 1900s when we provided for the direct election of senators under the 17th Amendment. The reason that we got the 17th Amendment was because there was this perception that only really rich people became senators by buying influence. And so it was really considered that senators, the whole senatorial process was corrupt and had to be reformed. And so you know, this idea that rich people become senators because they have lots of influence, we were, wait, we fixed that with, no, wait, we didn't fix that with this. It's the same, it didn't fix the problem. And it created a whole new set of problems, which is there's really nobody to represent the sovereign states in the in the federal legislature. Yeah, I'd love to see a repeal of the 17th Amendment. I think it'd be a great idea. I think it's one of the most important fixes we could have. I'm going to be realistic and say I think that's a stretch. And the reason I think it's a stretch is the narrative on the other side is going to be, why do you want to take away our right to vote for our senators? And people don't like to have their voting taking away, taken away. It sounds anti-democratic. I think over time, as we educate the American public, it is plausible. But I would say it's a little bit unlikely if we can get to this first convention in the next couple of years. Okay, let's see. Uh, let's see. Can amendments that are already in the Constitution 
be addressed to change the wording? The answer is, yeah, we can address them as long as they are addressed in a way to limit the scope, power, and jurisdiction of the federal government. It still has to fall within the application process. In other words, it has to either impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, it has to limit the scope, power, and jurisdiction of the federal government, or impose term limits. It's open as long as it does those things. One of the things that we did when we drafted this is we went to the leading conservative constitutional scholars in America and said, is there any way using this language you could propose amendments to increase the scope or power of the federal government? We wanted to make sure we couldn't. And they said no, that we got some drafting tweaks from all these constitutional scholars, Mike Ferris, Rob Nadelson, Randy Barnett. We wanted to make sure we, we nailed it. So the answer is you can address anything as long as it limits the scope, power, and jurisdiction of the federal government. Let's see. Um, as a question, uh, this is from Steve Boson. It says, thanks to you and Mike Ferris for so much we're doing for this critical cause. Will the webinar, including the Q&A, be made available at a link so the Convention of States Project can assist us in communicating what the project is using social media? And I think that my, I think the, uh, we're recording this. I'd have to ask our technical people, maybe they can respond to me whether we're going to post this afterwards. I'd be totally open having it posted. I think we have the capability to do that, but I'll double check on that for you, Steve. Uh, let's see. Next is, um, well, let's see. The Congressional Budget Office paints a bleak fiscal situation. Could it be even worse than they think? I think the answer is unequivocally absolutely yes. There's all kinds of stuff that they paint as off book. They say we're around $14 trillion uh, you know, uh, in unfunded liabilities, but really more like 140 trillion if you include all the unfunded liabilities. We are on the verge, literally, of a radical financial collapse like the world has never seen. The question is really just when when does it come? You know, if economists say something that can't continue indefinitely won't. And that's where we're at. I mean, the General Accounting Office, the CBO have all said this is unsustainable, the path we're on. It's unsustainable. And there are a few politicians who admit that. I think the best among them, Senator Tom Coburn, who now works with us at the Convention of States Project as our senior advisor, he's been screaming this fight into the wind for 16 years in Congress, 10 years in the Senate itself, right? And saying that it's unsustainable. Every year he puts out the waste book pointing out $400 billion of waste, fraud, and abuse. And every year they ignore it. It's bipartisan waste, fraud, and abuse. And they ignore it. They don't cut a single penny of it. So I think it is much worse than it's been posed in, you know, in general media. I think the crisis point is much closer. We're much closer to that tipping point than anybody knows. Another reason I think Convention of States is so important because we're not going to restrain them without calling a convention. It's just not going to happen. There's no way the politicians will never make the hard decisions. Generally speaking, and Coburn says this, most of the guys in Congress are cowards. And the only way you make them make hard decisions is by giving them no choice. And the way to give them no choice is to amend the Constitution in a way that forces them to make those hard decisions. All right, so I think at this point, we've been going uh, you know, almost an hour and 15 minutes. So I wanna close out here and let you guys go about your, your Saturdays. And first, I just wanna thank you again for appreciating you guys uh, for being here, for coming on a Saturday, for taking your time and your effort and spending spending that time, it's the most valuable thing you have, maybe away from your families, away from your job, just relaxing, sleeping in, spending that time to come learn about how to save the nation. I not only wanna thank you, but I wanna encourage you to be involved and engaged. I meet people every day when I'm traveling around the country who got involved, got engaged, never expected to be here. I meet people like Diane Gomez. Diane is our state director for Indiana. We passed Indiana because we have a great volunteer like Diane. She didn't ever intend to be the state director. She didn't really intend to be engaged. She found out about Convention of States, started to get engaged at a low level. Then one of our, our great national director who's not with us anymore, Jackie Peterson, went out and visited with her in Indiana, realized what a talent Diane Gomez was. Diane stepped away from her professional life to get involved in Convention of States on a volunteer basis ran that state, helped build up the grassroots, elevate regular people like you in that state. And ultimately, because of her efforts and all the great patriots she bought, brought in, we passed the Convention of States resolution in Indiana this year. It's incredible to have patriots like that. But remember, Diane started 
She didn't have big goals when she started in this movement. She didn't think she was going to be the person that led the team that passed that initiative in Indiana, but she got involved. So she's just like you watching a video online, got involved a little bit. It grew more and more until it was her overriding passion. By the way, Diane now works for the Convention of States Project. Once she passed Indiana, we saw the value in her incredible leadership and talent. We brought her on board as an employee of the project. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to take people like you, people like Diane Gomez, people like other state directors around the country who have done such a good job, people like Terry Richmond, who did it in Alabama, people like Jackie Peterson, who did it in Georgia, who have gone on to bigger and better and broader things, who are doing incredible things in politics, but they got involved just a little bit at first. And then their passion and their heart and their belief in the project got them involved more and more. So thanks for coming and taking that first step. If watching this is a first step for you, if you're getting more involved, I encourage you to do it. Contact your district captain, contact your state director. They can put you in touch with your regional director. Whatever your aspirations are, one thing I want to encourage you is just get involved. Because really, the nation's at stake. And really, truly, honestly, from the bottom of my heart, I'm going to tell you, it's up to you. I'll help you. Our team will help you. But ultimately, in the end, it's up to you, the sovereign citizen, to get involved and save the country. The founders were counting on you 200 plus years out to save and to continue what they started. So thanks for being with us here at Convention of States. Thanks for joining me on a Saturday morning. God bless y'all. And I look forward to talking with you soon. It's time for the states to take some action that is actually afforded to us in the Constitution. But we're stepping back into the role that the founders originally intended for us to be in, which is that this is a nation that is the United States. I'm an American, and that's why I'm here today. Because I believe in the Convention of States. I believe that Article 5 is the remedy that the framers gave to us, the people. 52 years old, I've never been uh, involved in any political campaign. I felt a very clear impression that this is the one thing I should get involved in. Kindest, most welcoming people who have made me feel empowered. I think it's wonderful how many people across generations have come to realize that Convention of States is the only way that we can get any kind of control over the federal government. It doesn't matter your age. We're all American citizens and we all have a voice. And that's why the Convention of States is so awesome because it's for we the people. So this is going on all over the country, but Tennessee is leading the way. And I'm very excited uh, that Tennessee is the first this year to pass their resolution on behalf of the Convention of States. This is real momentum. It's only going to get better if the light of freedom starts to shine brightly again. I believe that we're making history. We have a voice, and we should raise our voice. Now is the time. This is the solution as big as the problem. It answers the question, the most important question facing Americans today, who decides? The answer is folks in Tennessee, folks at home in your state, not Washington, D.C. So if you're not involved, Get involved at conventionofstates.com. Do it because America matters to you and her future matters to you.